and I am in charge of the Play Like a Champion program. I want to, we bring you together tonight for Play Like a Champion and to give you an idea of what our expectations are. And they happen to change each year based on feedback we've gotten from the year before. But I'd like to start the meeting with a prayer. Lord Jesus, you tell us that whenever two or more are gathered in your name, you are present in their midst. And so we are confident that as we lift up our thoughts to you, you are indeed with us. Help our influence on our student athletes to reflect your presence among us and within us. May all our actions give glory to your name and promote peace and love to the world. We pray this in your most holy name. Amen. We gather here tonight to give you the opportunity to understand what it means to celebrate the opportunity that your children have to play a high school sport. And I use the word celebrate because it should be an exciting time for you. But it's not Little League anymore, and it's not rec ball anymore. So a lot of times there are misunderstandings. Play Like a Champion is an approach to sports with spirituality, character development, teamwork, and leadership. Play Like a Champion is not everybody plays all the time in every game. And sometimes that is mistaken. When we talk about Play Like a Champion, our big push this year as it has been in the past a little bit, is to give your student athlete ownership of their team, ownership of their role on their team. One of the ways that we're starting that this year is to give more power, for lack of a better word, to the captains. So this year, the policy at Paul 6 has changed. The captains are asked to lead by example. Meaning, they get the water, they set up the field, they make sure everything's done to play the game, they get the balls, they clean up. In other words, in the same way as Jesus washed the feet of his disciples, our captains are going to take care of those sub-varsity teammates and those younger players so that they can learn what it's like to be a true leader. And every captain is given a prayer log. And we're asking that they pray before and after every game, every practice, and really any time that they gather as a team. We're putting it on the captains, not the coaches. The more things we put on the coaches, the less time they have to watch your athlete, the less time they have to plan. But the real reason is because your children need to build that character, build those leadership skills, mature as a young adult and take ownership so that if and when they play at the next level, they're ready. And that's what our goal is, to make them ready. Now being ready might mean understanding their role on the team. It might mean being a practice player. It might mean being a starter. But the thing is, your child was selected for the team, and it's all about the team. So if they don't play, or they don't play a lot, that shouldn't be the focus. And that's what Play Like a Champion is. Play Like a Champion is accepting your role as a teammate, as a player, as a role player, and maybe you're the guy who makes the kids that are playing on the team, on the field or on the court, a better player. One of the things that came up this past year was that the, um, there wasn't enough Catholic, I guess, faith or whatever in sports. And we tried really hard to, to make that difference because the reason you send your children here is because it's a Catholic school, so you have higher expectations. And so the way, we haven't had a chance to meet with the athletes yet. We've only met with the captains. So, I'm putting a lot on the captains, and the captains know that they are their the liaison to mid, from their teammates to mid. What we want to try to get you involved in is play like a champion, not 
just watching what your child is doing, not berating the officials, not screaming that, you know, so-and-so should be on the field because, you know, your kid's better. We've all been there, we've all done that. I have, have a daughter who played Division uh, three athletics. There were times where I probably wanted to strangle her coach, but I didn't because that's not my place. I wouldn't even approach her coach. It's my daughter's place. Now you might say, well, she was in college. No, she needed to do that here as well. And we had an unusual situation because I was her coach. So fortunately she was good, so it wasn't a big deal, but it still was tough because the only time we got along was when she finally started to drive and could drive herself home from games and didn't have to listen to me the whole way home. So I get it. I understand where you're coming from. But we want to try to change your mindset. So instead of asking, did you win? How about, how did it go? Did you have a good time? What did you do well? What can you do better? Are you trying to be better on every single play, every single day? What are you doing to make yourself better? Because the coaches are the only ones who can make that judgment. They're the ones who see your, your kids every day at every practice for three hours or two hours or whatever it happens to be. But what we need from you is the commitment that your child will be at that practice, that your child will respect the coach, and that you'll make the commitment which is sometimes really hard, especially if you have multiple kids, that you'll make the commitment to get them there. Freshman year, we give a little bit of slack, okay? If they have to miss something, they have to miss something. JV gets a little tighter. Varsity, there's no excuses. We've asked you, and those that are in fall sports, you will have already received a contract that we will ask if you sign, the athlete will sign, the coach will sign, and then we'll hang on to it. It's kind of lengthy, but it explains all our policies. And the one policy that I want to elaborate on is the bus policy, because that's the one I've had the most questions about. We ask that your child go to and from games on the bus. I understand if you live in Washington Township and we play Washington Township, it's silly for them to have to come back here. So two times out of the season, you can take them once when you're in your own district and once when you maybe want to go out to dinner or something and you just don't feel like driving all the way back here. If you have extenuating circumstances, just reach out and let me know. All you have to do is send me an email and say, look, we, we really we have to take her home from, you know, Vineland or whatever today. She can't go back to Paul 6, I just don't have enough time to get to pick up my eight-year-old. Okay, and that's fine, but I need to know it on a game-by-game -game basis. It's a liability for us. But if you ask a lot of the kids, the bus ride is half the fun. So whether you win or lose, you do it as a team. So you go as a team, you come home as a team. You're probably miserable and quiet. It used to drive me crazy because I'd be so annoyed that I lost. And 10 minutes away from the gym, all the girls would be like, arr, arr, arr. nobody, nobody. If I asked them the score, they probably wouldn't have been able to tell me. And that's really the way it should be. So that's the experience that we want the kids to have. And it's our liability. Okay, we're responsible for your child. The only other uh, thing that's come up is the idea of the word bullying kind of being thrown around a lot. <coughs> if you think that your child is being bullied for some reason or by someone, Bullying, remember, has to be repetitive, harassing behavior over and over and over. So, and that was kind of redundant because repetitive is over and over and over, but it has to keep happening, the same behavior. So a coach reprimanding your child is not a bully. If a coach belittles your child, then I want to know about it, okay? And generally, You'll get that in the guidelines, but most coaches will ask you to have a 24-hour rule. If you have a question, don't approach them after a game. Don't approach them as they're walking off the field. Shoot them an email. Hey, coach, I'd really like to sit down and talk to you, or can I call you, or can you call me? 
and then you know by the time that happens, you might have cooled down just a little bit with whatever the situation was. Okay, but everybody at the freshman level, we try not to, to cut anybody unless the numbers are unmanageable. The JV level, I have to say, the juniors end up being an endangered species because if we don't see them playing varsity, that's the kid who doesn't get selected. But we try to do it early enough so that if they want to play another sport, they can. Or if they want to try out for something else, they can. And then varsity, varsity you're playing, it's the real deal. So there's, a, there's kids that you might have been the best player or your child might have been the best player in eighth grade, but now there's five of him. So there's a lot of competition. But before I introduce our guest speakers, that's the word I want to focus on is competition. Because a lot of people take that as an antagonistic kind of word. But competition, the Latin word, really means striving with. So it's actually people trying to work together. You enjoy games that are neck and neck much more than you enjoy games that are blowouts. When the competition is high and each team is working together the best that they possibly can, that's when you have the best competition. So with that, I asked two people here tonight who I respect a great deal. Both of them are female collegiate Division I All-Americans. Both of them have coached and still do coach. Both of them have children who play at the D1 level. And both of them still coach their own children. So they come with a boatload of experience on parenting the athlete. So without me saying another thing, I'd like to introduce from where? Kingsway, I guess I should say. She te well, Janine teaches at Kingsway. She has a son at Villanova and two boys at St. Augustine, but we won't. We, we'll still listen to her, even though that's <laughs> And then Felicia Boyle Jenkins, who is the Kingsway girls basketball coach, has had a son, as you might recall, at Villanova, Chris Jenkins. Her daughter is a senior, or her daughter that graduated last year is at East Tennessee State never picking up a basketball again. And her younger daughter is a senior this year, and she coaches her at Kingsway. So, Janine and Felicia. connect with all of you regardless. I know you're kind of spread out, but uh, Felicia and I both appreciate the chance to be here. We were laughing because Donna asked if we believe in free speech, and we said, yeah, constitutional right. And she said, good, because you're given one this Wednesday. <laughs> and so here we are. Um, but we've done this before. We, um, we have a very good friendship. We connected through Villanova basketball. Both our boys uh, were on the team. Uh, Timmy is still there. They were roommates in 2016 when they hit the national champ uh, when they won the national championship. And the funny thing is we came at it from totally different perspectives. Uh, both having very similar backgrounds in our own careers. Both having very similar backgrounds with the way we coached our children. But very different with Timmy on crutches, having endured already one of what was going to be three major hip surgeries. He was cooking for Chris Jenkins because they were roommates. And, he, and Chris was out there scoring all the points, and um, she and I, you know, became very close and went through a lot together. So um, we're going to kind of tag team this with you, and she has some great stuff to explain to you. But I think overall, what the two of us are hoping to do is say, number one, we've been in your shoes and in your seats, and we still are. She has a daughter playing for her. I have two boys still playing in high school. We've been um, on one side being the coaches. I used to coach at Clearview High School. Uh, I still coach the boys in the fall and the summer. Felicia's on the bench at Kingsway High School. So we also see it from the other perspective. But what I'm hoping we can do is just give you a few gems, a few perspectives that maybe as you go into the best of times, and sometimes they are the most challenging of times. As you watch your kids compete, 
and you watch them try to get their dreams and you want to support them and you want to help them and you want to you bleed for them i remember going to bed at night asking god let me have that hip pain i'll take it you know and felicia same situation as she's watched her kids go through various challenges you'll take it yourself but you have to stop yourself just short of fighting for your kids that battle on the field and in the practice gym you gotta let them fight it out and so i think we can help you a little bit with some of the perspectives and stories and maybe you know, I know you're going to laugh at a few things, but maybe you'll also reconsider and it will help you through to make sure you have more wonderful times than stressful times. Because this game, all these sports, all these sports in high school, they can really challenge, um, challenge and reward you at the same time. Well, I'll first start with um, some of Chris's experiences at Villanova and me as a parent. Chris struggles at Villanova wasn't with the injuries, of course, it was with his diet and his body. We want to talk about that. So to start, you guys make sure your kids are eating on a healthy diet as, as much as you can here. So when they get to Villanova or whatever school they're really going to, they don't have the same issues that my son had. And it was not an easy task for him and or the people around him. And I also talk about the hardships that he went through at Villanova. Everybody saw the shot go in, but no one saw all of the hard and the struggles that he went through to even be in a position to even have a chance to take a pass from an unselfish point guard to make a best shot in college basketball is what has been said. His freshman year, Holly recruited coming in, overweight, he gets on campus, He's about 6'5", so he's carrying his weight really good, so he's looked like he's probably 235, but he walked on campus at a, a heavy 285 with a, a body fat percentage of 23, which is considered obese, if anybody know about health and nutrition. So as a parent, when Coach Jay and Shaq sat me down, of course I was nervous because I didn't know how he was going to compete with that body at that level when everybody else is lean and mean. He has a skill set, but he does not have the body to match the skill set. So of course, it's hearing that coming from a coach, and they're trying to figure out how we're going to get this kid on the court for more than two to three minutes at a time. And going to a uh, star athlete, four to five star athlete coming out of high school where you're used to playing, and it doesn't matter what body you're in, because you're averaging 20 to 30 points a game, you're the Raining uh, two times, Gatorade player of the year, third year you're runner up. So you are used to getting your minutes on the court, but then now you get to Villanova and you're saying you've been told that you might pay three to five minutes top. That's hard to handle as a star athlete. So along his journey, he goes in. Between him and Coach Day, I was getting phone calls and texts the whole time. But as a parent, I have to hear my son's concern, concerns, and as a coach over here, I have to understand Coach Jay's position because it's not about my son. Coach Jay has been doing this for many years, and thank God I've been on every side of the ball, player, coach, mother, fan. So I understand every ring of that ball. I was not going to get to Coach Jay and say, you know, you better play my son. I want to see my son play. Most parents would call, text, but I was not going to be that parent. On the other side, I would step, I would hear what Coach Jay would say over here, then I would go back to my son. If you want to play, then you have a whole lot of extra stuff that you're going to do, that you're going to work to do, outside of what your teammates are doing. Because they, the teammates was going to their study hall and their uh, individuals and regular practice and going home and relaxing. Whereas Chris was getting up a whole hour extra running two to three miles, extra 10 miles, extra with Coach Jay in a day, in the morning and the evening. I would get videos with Coach Jay, not so young self on the treadmill, right next to my son, running just as hard as Chris was running on that treadmill. When I got those videos, of course I cried, because I knew Chris was not doing this battle or going through this by himself. However, he had to be the one also to be willing to put the work in. When everybody else was home still sleeping, he was up, put 
be in that extra rope, running the treadmill, underwater, all that extra grooving stuff that he had to go through. And when he finally dropped the 35 pounds and he finally played more than three minutes, then now he's thinking, I'm ready. I need to be playing more than three to five minutes. So here come another hurdle. I have to hear my son's concerns, and then I have to get Coach Jay's text saying, you know, Felicia, I should have played KJ more. I was like, no, you shouldn't. And he was like, why do you say that? I say, because if you should have, you would have. So obviously it's something that KJ has not earned from you yet. Because if you have your coach's trust, then he doesn't have to question himself. So I told him, I said, Coach Jay, whatever you do, do not start to change who you are, what you are, and what you've been doing for the past 25 to 30 plus years in coaching game of basketball to please Chris Jenkins. He will work for everything that he will get at Villanova. And Chris would come out of the games. Every time Coach Jay, he would miss an assignment, miss a defense assignment, didn't grab that rebound, Janine contested. If you go back and look at the film, you see it himself. He would come right back, walk back Coach Jay, Blocked down in the seat, everybody in America knew he was unhappy with that playing time and that decision that Coach Jay made. Of course, I would get the phone calls from Chris. I'm not happy. I should be playing more. I'm better than some of the guys. I said, oh, really? And then he was talking about, I don't know, who remembers uh, Javon Pinkston, number 22, McDonald's All-American on Villanova scene. Now, he's talking about guys like that, that he's better than. So I said, okay, if you're better than Javon in practice on every play, every day, then we'll have a conversation with Coach Jay. If you're not, you have to get out of my phone and go back to the gym. <laughs> so parents, I'm saying this to you, that when your kid come home and sit down at your table and complain on some nights, because they will, they, I promise you they will. They will not be happy every day with their coach's decisions about their playing time, their practice time, or what have you. You have to be the most consistent part in their life if you want to be successful, if you want them to be successful in their sport. They cannot have an outlet at your table. You understand? If not, if you give them an outlet, then you're going to be the one with all the headaches and all the things that they're not going to achieve because they're not going to ever work hard enough to get over that initial hurdle to be the best that they can be. And long story short, all the hard work does stay up. Who's a Villanova fan in here? That championship ring. All the hard work that you do, you do have to tell them about Chris calling and saying he's transferring. When he's only getting three to five minutes a game. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, every kid thinks, in America that, um, I think JP was going into his senior year. JP didn't have a really good, healthy, uh, you know, junior year. He got sick, you know, you know with the leg thing. So, you know, Javon Pinkson, well, I call him JP, my bad. You know, Javon Pinkson. He wore number 22. And JP was really thinking about coming back for his senior year. And he did. So Chris, all upset because he knows what he would have been starting, you know, his sophomore, going to sophomore year. Now he's back on that bench again. That bench is not a pretty place for someone who's used to not being on it. So he calls me, he's like, you know, I think I'm a transfer, I get all these texts, I mean, when I get off of work, it's like 25 texts from Chris about he's not happy, JP's coming back, if you come back, I'm going to transfer. So I look at my phone again, and the first thing I do, I call Coach Jay. I was like, I don't know if you know what I know. I said, I just looked at my phone and Chris is saying something about he's going to transfer if JP's coming back. What's going on with that? I didn't know JP was leaving. And Coach Jay said, me either. <laughs> so we was on the same page. So um, I said, he said, well, Chris is not dumb. He's not going to transfer. But I'm looking at 25 texts from a kid that thinks he's going to transfer. So I got the phone Coach Jay, I said, well, let me call Chris, so let's make sure we're all on the same page. Because I wanted to make sure that Coach Jay didn't want him to transfer. That's the first thing. To make sure that he was once at Villanova before I go hammer Chris. So I call him. He's in the gym. He's working out. I was like, are you by yourself? He said, no, ma'am. I said, well, um, can you go to a corner by yourself 
So you can kind of like, you know, we can have a conversation about the 25 plus texts that you sent to my phone. And it was a FaceTime call, it wasn't a regular call, I needed to see his face so he could understand he needed to see my face and my demeanor and how serious that was. So when I called him, he was like, yes ma'am. I said, you remember when you were being recruited and you narrowed your, your schools down to your top five and you, know, you was getting ready to go on your visits and I said, the only thing that I require from you when you're making your decision is that you know something about the coach, you know something about the coaching staff, you know something about your players that you're going to be playing with and you know something about the players that have gone on before you and you have to know something about the community that's around your program. Those are going to be the people who support you when the times get hard. He said, yes ma'am. I said, you do remember that I said that it will be your decision on the school of your choice. You just had to make sure you sat down and gave me that list that I gave you and it was just one thing with me. We had a no transfer clause. He forgot about that clause. <laughs> He's like, uh, yes ma'am. I said, is Coach Jay, you know, retiring? And is he taking a new job somewhere? He was like, no ma'am. I said, well, you can, you can transfer. The only deal is you'll be transferring your back to Villanova. You know, and he was like, and he was just looking, you see the somber look on his face. Because I held his foot to the fire. You chose Villanova, you chose Coach J, you chose the team, the coaching staff, and your Villanova community. That's where you're going to rest for your four years. If every parent held their kids' feet to the fire, we wouldn't have over 800 plus, 500, 800 plus transfers per year. No matter where you go, you're going to have to work hard. No matter where you go, you're going to have to sacrifice your eye for the sake of the team. You're going to be a four or five star athlete that's going to be on somebody's bench. And you're going to think, or your kid is going to think that they're better than the person that they're playing in front of, that's playing in front of them. But at the end of the day, it's never about the individual. It is always about the program and the process. Believing that if you stick to it and you hold your kid accountable and reliable for the things that they do, it will all come to a good end. And that's assured. I'm a living witness and testimony that it was not easy, but it was definitely worth it. I wouldn't change it for the world. So I think when you hear that story and, and especially her delivery, um, you can understand why she captivates my children as well, along with all her players. Um, when I can't get Matthew and Andrew, and, and I'm coaching Matthew in a year or two, then one of us is getting medicated, I promise you that. <laughs> but if I can't get them to listen, then she's right there. And somehow she reaches those kids. And I think um, what I wanted to, to share with you is that having been a coach, but right now a teacher, and I'm a business education teacher at Kingsway uh, Regional High School, my, my field is to teach the kids uh, in the Business Leadership Academy how to become the best product or the best um, service that they will ever market, they themselves. They need to market themselves, they need to understand their value. And then I teach them about their life and if they can manage their life, they can also manage a business and vice versa. So when we as parents sit down and think about what's really important, what's life really like? I asked a lot of parents, I've asked a lot of kids to describe life. Just give me one word. I do that in class all the time. Give me one word. And I had all kinds of words thrown at me today from different teachers, administrators, and students. Challenging, rewarding, stressful, binding, rigorous, joyful, exhausting, amazing. And I thought to myself, isn't that funny that all of those words are taught on the basketball court more than in the classroom? taught on the football field. My father's a tennis pro. Uh, I've watched baseball players, my nephews go through. And I think athletics teaches you those things more than anything. And of course we learn more when it's hard. 
And so I step back and I say, okay, with, with Timmy's situation, he had a really nice high school career, had a chance to play with USA Basketball, did some next year, next year. He's never lost the faith that he's going to be fine. And so I think when I looked at those words today and I knew I was going to be speaking to you, I said, well, the best classroom is the athletic field that your kids are on. So you don't come into the classroom too often. At least I don't think you do. And I certainly didn't. I let the teachers teach. And it's hard because we've all had coaches that we just don't see eye to eye with, that we just don't agree with sometimes. But you let them teach, let them coach and support your kids because in the end, the, the game really, in any athletic arena, it, it is completely comparable to life. You've got referees in life, you know, we, we as adults now know, there are people saying to us, oh, nope, you, you don't get that ball, you just travel, you know, you lose the ball, it's a turnover, and we're not on an athletic field, but we know what that feels like. You've worked really hard, you're trying to get something to work, it doesn't work. Things don't go your way. You know, family challenges, uh, financial challenges, job challenges, family challenges, it's gonna happen. But we also know that there's rules and there's lines that keep us in bounds and keep us, you know, the way we need to be so that we can keep moving forward. And I think that's what sports really teaches our kids. So it's that grind, it's the ability to let them get knocked down and get hurt, have their feelings hurt, maybe um, their ego hurt a little bit, and it might not be fair, but we all know, we tell our kids life's not fair. So where's the best place you're gonna let them prepare for that? And then again, life is joyful. It's fabulous. It's amazing. There's so many wonderful things that come every day. So you have to kind of weather that storm and let your kids weather it as well. I wish I could take Timmy's situation off his hands, but I can't. He's just gotta deal with it. Uh, but they were roommates. Timmy wanted to make sure he was supporting Chris. Chris was shooting the lights out that year. It was his junior year. And Timmy kept saying it was because of the burgers he was cooking. He learned to cook when he was hurt. And uh, he would cook for Chris. And Chris would, you know, love it. In fact, maybe a little too much. But still, you know, he was still shooting the ball really well. So Chris is Timmy's roommate. He hits the shot to win the national championship. Next year, Timmy's living with a bunch of guys. I forget even who he was living with, Dante and those guys. 2018, he's living with Dante and Phil Booth. Dante's the hero of the 2018 National Championship. Now the whole team's fighting over who gets to live with Timmy. <laughs> <laughs> they all think it's because of the way he cooks, right? And that's not what I do, so we don't know where he got that. Um, but in the end, I think that the way we describe what we want for our kids and what we want them to learn and these are the words that a lot of parents toss to me on email today. I, I hit up a bunch of my, my parents and the kids I work with. They want them to learn lessons of trust, loyalty, work ethic, respect, how to compete, perspective, teamwork, and grit. And there's no better place than on the athletic field, on the court, anywhere you, you, know, you put your kids. So I'm just gonna tell you that having been through some tough ones and not sure if Timmy will ever really play basketball again or not, we'll know in a few months if he's gonna be able to do that. And realizing that I have two more at home, it's, it's definitely a marathon and it's not a race. And I wish all of you to be able to enjoy as many minutes as you can. At that dinner table, like she said, don't give them an out. But definitely take some time to talk about what they're learning how they're enjoying it, what their challenges are, and ask them how they're gonna deal with it. Because that's what I throw back at my kids now. How are you gonna deal with that? Like Felicia said, are you better every day, every play, than the kid is in front of you? And if they say yes, that's great that they feel that way. Now get out there and convince your coach too. Okay, so these are just the, the little gems that I hope that we can share with you that have been shared with us. Um, and I guess one of the things that was told me by Todd Pinchowski, who's a great, great scout, is horses wear blinders for a reason when they're racing. And sometimes he said, just tell your kids to put the blinders on and focus. And they need to focus and, and grit it out and gut it out and stop worrying about this or that. And, and that's how a horse is successful and that's how he believes a lot of athletes become successful. So, I think I'm going to turn it over to you to tell um, a 
couple of those first gen issues. No? Uh, we're going to open up for, uh, I guess, question, Q and A's. But before we do that, um, Ms. Donna gave you a job application, at least I thought that was a job application. <laughs> you guys, I hope that you don't need all of this to get your kid in perspective to play any sport. I know they miss some of the stuff when they come in you have with them season. There's a lot you remember when you had your own job. You got a lot going on, so you should not have to sign your life away to make sure that your kid is held accountable or you keep yourself in check. So get rid of your application. I thought this was a job application. I thought you wanted to hire me. Man. I read the rules. I said athletic department training rules for parents and students. I'm like, whoo! But um, on a more serious note, um, we're going to open up for questions. If you have any questions, you can ask anything. I have one right here. Can you stand up so we can hear you clearly, please? Yes. The question is for you, Ms. Jenkins. I just want to know, is it true? Is your son Chris Jenkins and Nate Britt have brothers? Exactly. I am Chris Jenkins' biological mother. If a lot of you don't know, the Villanova fans would know the story. I moved Chris when he was 12 years old to live with the Brits. Chris started a rough till when he was like 12, 13, picking up the wrong crowd. Me and his dad was going through a separation, semi slash divorce, so when we made the decision to move him, we wanted him in a better place, a more stable place, and he wanted to play, remain on the, um, the AAU team, so it was kind of hard for me to have my job in South Carolina and his dad was working in South Carolina at the time and to get him back and forth to DC just to play on a AAU basketball team. So when we was going through what we was going through, we made a conscious decision based on his academical status, who the people he had around him. Because since being a star, four or five star athlete early, you just, the kids take on bad company. They don't know it's bad company. Their parents would know that it's bad company, but they don't see it until it's too late. Out of the two of the three kids that he was hanging with, roughly, I think two of them are probably dead now and one is in jail. So I think my decision to move him, to get him in a better area, was definitely beneficial to me because my son is still here and he's not locked up. He doesn't, he's never been suspended from school. So, you know, you make hard decisions based on your children, you know, desires and hopes to be whatever they want to be in life. And as parents, your job is supposed to be a pilot and the biggest supporter to get them where they need to be, not an excuse maker for them. So I never gave him excuses, but I did give him every effort and opportunity to do what he said he wanted to do. And he's now over in Germany playing professionally. So yes, that is my son. He grew up with the Brits in uh, DC. They step brother step. But she also taught Chris how to shoot. <laughs> she did. How many shots today? 500? Yeah. Yeah. You have to make 500 shots. Okay. So the story behind Felicia, and this is kind of funny, is we're at the Final Four, and it's the first time I met her back in 2016. I had just started teaching at Kingsway, and I walk in the room, and I see her with her braids and her gear, and I'm like, oh my gosh. Like, I just was drawn to her. So I sit down, we start talking about our boys, and realize they were roommates, and she was in from South Carolina, and I'm from South Jersey. and. You know, we're chatting about, and she said she wanted to coach again. And I said, have you been coaching? She said, well, I taught Chris. You know, I coached my son, just like I coached Timmy. And we both repeated, like at the same time, we said 500 shots a day. And that's what it was, 500 shots a day. Then it was 500 makes a day, once they got a scholarship. So we have, we were kindred spirits. So Dr. Lavender at Kingsway had offered me the, the coaching job at Kingsway, and I said I couldn't do that. I've got, you know, the two younger boys and their opposite schedules. So I text him real quick from the parents meeting before the Final Four and I said, I'm sitting here with Felicia Jenkins, she's the best candidate for the job. What do you think? He said, okay, tell her that we want to get her an interview. We need to get her up to Kingsway. I said, okay. So then they win the first game, you know, Dr. Lavender's watching. Then they win the second game and her son hits the shot and I get two text messages within seconds of the shot going in. The first one is Timmy's surgeon. Get Timmy off the dog pile, okay? 
I'm not doing the hip again. The second text I get like this was Dr. Lavender. Can you get her to sign something, even her program? We need her committed now. We haven't even interviewed her or met her yet, so we got her up there. They've, they've been very, very lucky to have her. Questions? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I speak loud, so I'll, I'll like this. Um, is there a chance, this might be more for the actual school versus um, you, is there a chance that there will be a similar message from either you two or players that have gone through it, children, your children, whatever, <coughs> that will be given to our athletes as well so that they'll get to maybe hear some of this wonderful insight that I think is not only important for us as parents to hear, but obviously equally important for our young athletes. Yes, we usually do meet with the athletes. Unfortunately, the athletes usually have to listen to me um, and my stories, but we are filming them. So it will be on our webpage, but I also hope to, to show it to the athletes in the general meeting. Thank you. Hey, Ms. Dunn, if you need us to come back, we'll do that for you. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm happy to come back. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Questions? Come on, Bill and fans. <laughs> Make us proud. I guess you covered it. Okay. Come on, not the Bill of Old fans. Someone said something. Are they going to do it again this year? They might. They're really, really good this year. <laughs> They're really good and. The good thing about it, uh, you know, Coach Jay, they wasn't expecting Dante and Omari to leave. Right. So, you know, that left some big shoes to fill. Thank God Phil came back, Eric Pascal, all of them could have left because all of them graduated. So um, we had two solid pieces to really stay. We had some young cats that came in last season. And we have some really good pieces that they added around. So I'm just hoping and praying that the gelling process takes fast, you know, take fast, no uh, niche, and they understand what's going on first on the defensive side of the ball, because you know defense is what gets us where we want to be. We back, we have the best defense in the country, hands down against any team. So you know if the kids come in and learn that, I think we'll be okay this season. I mean, I, I'm expecting some great things. Yeah. I have a question it's for our parents, maybe, because I get this question a lot from parents um, at the varsity level. How do you justify a freshman playing in front of your senior who's been with the program for four years? But a freshman she comes in experience, and yeah. replaces them. In fact, we both had that years ago. She had it recently, yeah. I had it last year. Um, is a, a lacrosse player, but she was a 6'1", 6'2", a freshman came in, and I had four seniors, I think, on the, on the bench behind this kid. The one thing that I do, I take pride in, I meet with my team first, and then I meet with my parents, and then I meet with the parents and the players. And that's to make sure that we're on the same page. The one thing, the one consistent thing that I do know is that you will find someone who is more athletically inclined and just God-given talent that's going to be better than your kid. And we have to be okay with that. It happens to everybody. Chris is going through it now over in Germany. You know, it doesn't matter the, the, the level. Um, and I tell my parents, the few things that we're going to do right is that we're not going to bash each other. We're not going to talk about the opposing team. And if your kid does not come to practice, I don't care how good they are, they will not play. And I want my parents to understand that. And it's nothing against you individually. It's across the board. And you know, I've done it. Morgan got hurt, and the parents wanted to see him play. That's my best player on the team. I sat him down. I put her on the bench, and I played her when I thought she was ready. When I thought she needed to come out, I took her out. I, was, I have earmuffs on when it comes to parents just wanting to see their kids perform and not look at all the logistics and the bigger picture. You have to trust your coaching staff. And you have to hold your kids accountable, meaning if you are not playing, then that means you are not better than them on every 
day or every play. Get in the gym, work harder, and whatever I can do as a parent to get you weight training, extra skills training, I'll do that. But you gotta be willing to do the extra mile yourself. Just don't come home and complain and say, I'm a senior, I should be playing. That's not how it goes. You, you have to put your best talent on the playing field. Now this is for sports, this is for teachers. I'm not going to hire, hire a bad teacher. If I'm a CEO in a 500 company, you think I'm going to go hire some bad guy or bad young lady to lose my money? So it all is on levels. And it, but it all means the same thing. You are going to hire the best candidate, you're going to play the best student athlete, and everybody else has to continue to work hard. And when they fall down, you have to be the consistent to help them get back up and get at it again. Thanks. You're welcome. Any more questions? I just want to thank everybody. You've been like a, a really nice audience and we enjoy being here. I think we both like to come back and speak to the kids. If there's an opportunity, we'd be happy to do that. Donna, thanks for having us. And I wish everyone a really, really successful, healthy, above all things, healthy athletic season. Thank you so much. It's so great. Um, I did initially ask for their sons to come, but it was an NCAA violation, so we couldn't do it. But no, I, I hope that, you know, maybe just one little piece of something sticks in your head and helps us. And a lot of times, you know, the, the people that need to hear this message the most are not the people that, that are sitting here, but my hope is that you can help us um, to spread that message. You can help us to make the, the playing fields and the courts and the stands and everything else a lot more positive um, this year. And through thick and thin, you know, one thing I can guarantee is we always have your kids' best interests at heart. So I thank you for coming. The field hockey team is going to have their parent meeting um, in the dining hall. The baseball, if there are baseball people here and you want to come down the front to meet the baseball coach, He'll hang for a little bit for his parent meeting, freshman soccer. Um, if you want to just go to the back instead of a classroom, since you know there's plenty of room. And is the, the boys lacrosse coach, did he make it? Yeah. I hear him. Oh, okay. The boys lacrosse coach, if you want to go over into that corner, and he'll have um, his meeting. A lot of the other teams have already met. Um, if you want to just mill around and take a look at their rings, you know, you can do that too. But um, I thank you so much for coming out tonight, and please drive safely home. Thank you.